Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to use an open source project that I've created. The application was created using SwiftUI, and I've also used the combined framework for network calls. It uses the MVVM design pattern and is built for iPhone, iPad, and Mac. For the Mac, I've used Mac Catalyst, and you may not find that it's an ideal Mac citizen, but it certainly is functional. In this video, I'll present a short demonstration of what the app is all about, and then I'll show you how you can create your own project on the Google Cloud platform and obtain your own YouTube Data API key. We'll test the application and then locate the compiled Mac app so that you can have it on your own computer. Following that, I'll take you through a walkthrough of the code, and along the way, I'll point out to you some of the resources and videos that others have created that have helped me develop the code. It should be noted that this version is version 1 of my app and I just wanted to get the idea out there so that you might be able to use it as a starting point for your own version. I encourage you to download and use the code as you like. I have many ideas for future versions that will include iCloud sharing between platforms. Now before I get started, please leave a comment below if you enjoy the video and give it a thumbs up. Also, subscribe to my channel and make sure you ring the bell to be notified of new videos. So if this is something you want to learn, then keep watching. The first thing that you need to do is download the app from my GitHub repository, and I'll leave a link in the notes below. Just download and expand the archive. If you open the app, you'll notice that there's one Swift package dependency, and that's the SD web image package that I use to cache the video thumbnail images. Now the first thing that I'll ask you to do is to change your bundle ID so that your bundle does not contain my domain. I'm going to test the app out right now but I want to first test it on an iPhone, so I'll choose the iPhone 12 Pro Max. Now, when the app runs, I get this alert telling me that I need an API key. And then once you have it, I'll be able to enter it into the constants file. And this is located in the models group. There's a link on that page to the Google Developer site for getting started with the YouTube Data API. So let's just go to that site and you'll see that it has detailed instructions on how to get started. Now, you'll need a Google account, and I suggest that you go first to the API console. And I can get there by clicking on this link. It tells me now to log into my Google account, so let me choose this one. I have two, and this is one that I use for demos. After my two-factor authentication, I'm in at the console. Now, once you're connected, you'll see this screen. And in my case, I have several projects already, 
and the most recent one is already selected. If this is the new developer account, it will say select a project. In either case, select the drop down and choose new project. Give your project a name and click on create. Now, if it's not currently selected, select it from the drop down menu. And you may have to wait until the project has been created if you've done this right away. Next, click on Library and search for YouTube and select the YouTube Data API version 3 and then click on Enable. Now go back to the Google Cloud Platform menu to see your dashboard and then click on the Go to APIs overview. When you're there, click on Credentials and then click on Create Credentials and select API key. Once it's been created, copy the key and return to Xcode. Now I just want to point out here that I'll be deleting this project as soon as I finish this video, so this key will not be valid. You will need to get your own. You enter the key between the quotes on the static API key property. When you're adding channels to your app, you can add by username or by channel ID. Not all YouTube channels have a YouTube username. My channel does, and it's Stuart Lynch, so I'm just going to copy that from this text here and run the app. I can select channel name from this segment control and paste in my name and tap on the add button. My channel gets added. Now, Sean Allen is another iOS content provider, and he doesn't have a channel name. As you saw from the demo at the start, you can use the browser to search YouTube for a channel and copy the channel ID from the URL. I've listed a number of my favorites here, so let's just copy Sean's. Now I can select channel ID and paste that ID in to create a link to this channel. As you can see now, when I tap on one of my watch channels, I can see all of the channel playlists. And when I tap on a playlist, I get all of the videos within that playlist. And I can watch any one of them in the app. Let's switch now to change our target to Mac and run once more. I still have Sean's ID on my clipboard, but this time, since I'm running an, a Mac, I'll just Command V to paste it in and then add it. If I drill down, I see all of Sean's playlists and videos. In a future version, I hope to have iCloud sharing enabled so that all devices will see the same list of channels. Now, if I want to install that compiled version of the Mac app on my own computer, I can expand the products group and locate the app, and then right-click and choose Show in Finder. Now, let me quit Xcode right now, and I can option-drag that app onto my desktop to make a copy. Now, I can launch the app, and if I switch to channel name, I can add my channel by my channel name. And, as you see, I've added it with links to all of my playlists and videos. Now there's one more thing you might want to consider, and that is to further restrict access to the API. I've not explored these options yet myself, but you can see that you can restrict access to iOS apps only by bundle ID, and you can also specify that the API key can only be used for the YouTube Data API. Now if you're still interested in a walkthrough of the code in this project, then keep watching. I'll be providing you with links to resources that can help you out if you don't understand what I've done. The first thing I want to point out is that in the info.p list, I've restricted the iPhone interface orientation to be portrait only, but allowed all orientations for the iPad. And this means that I don't have to worry about the layouts for larger iPhones and trying to present multiple split views on a smaller device when in landscape mode. 
Now when the app launches, you see that it presents the channel picker screen. And this is the screen where you select the channels that you wish to watch. There's a navigation view so that I can present a navigation bar, but I want to ensure that regardless of device, I don't present any detail view. So I specify that the navigation view style is stack navigation view style. As this view opens, I need to know whether or not I'm running on a Mac. So I assign a Boolean value to a state property called Catalyst based on the current target's environment. I also check to see if I've entered the API key. And if not, I present an alert. And to present the alert, I use a technique that I covered in this video. It uses an enum called alert type that allows me to specify the alert type and present it when I set the value in my view model to a particular type. Now, if the API key has been entered, I go ahead and load any saved channels using the get all channels function in my view model, the channel picker view model. I'm using core data to save all of my retrieved information. And I'm using techniques that I learned from Muhammad Azam's core data course. All entities are loaded and mapped to a channel view model. Adding a channel requires a request being made to the API, and this is done via the view models add channel function triggered by this button. I pass in the value of the text field along with a Boolean property that indicates whether or not I'm searching by username or by channel ID. This function calls the update managers get results for function, which completes with a result type. And the result will either be an error or it will return a found result. I then check to see if this is a duplicate of one that I already have or if there is no channel for that specified ID or username. If everything is OK, I add a new channel. If we dig into the update manager gets results function, it forms a URL string using the fetch type, fetch type enum. And this is an enum that has an associated value so that when searching for an ID or username, I can retrieve the appropriate URL along with the API key. It then calls the results publisher, passing in the URL. And this function returns a combined publisher. In an earlier series that I produced called Mobile Weather App, I went over fetching data from an API. And in the last video, I converted an API service function to use combined. This function here is similar to the one, but with one big difference. The YouTube API request will only return a maximum of 50 items. So whether I'm searching for a channel, a channel's playlist, or a playlist set of videos, I want to make sure that I keep calling the getJSON function until I have all values. And this is a recursive operation. So for this, I use a technique that was covered in an article by Donnie Walls where he goes over how to recursively execute a paginated network call with Combine. I was stuck on this for quite some time, so thanks to Donnie for answering my questions and getting me on the right track. It uses a future publisher and always checks to see if there is a next page token being received. It uses a combined future, which is a publisher that eventually produces a single value and then finishes or fails. And this is what I need. So back in Update Manager and the Results Publisher function, I can now handle the results and return a publisher containing an array of items or an API error. Now remember that this function itself is called by the get results for function that itself has a completion handler that has a result type as the completion argument. And this is an array of items or an error. So when I'm fetching the channel, there will be a single item in the array or an error. So back at the starting point, when we are in our add channel function, we can switch on that result and deal with what we get.
The entire channel picker content is embedded in a Z stack. And when I select an item in the list, the select channel value is assigned and we set show channel to true. This will then present the start view over top using a transition scale effect. Start view itself is a navigation view that will present a sidebar, a text view, and an image placeholder. Now this is only presented if the horizontal class size is regular, which because we are forcing the iPhone to portrait mode only, will be the case for iPads and Mac. When the view is presented, the sidebar is collapsed. And I wish there was a way to have it presented, but I, I'm not aware at this time of this video that it's possible in SwiftUI. And that is why the second view has instructions to select the playlist. If we're on an iPhone, I just present the sidebar, which will look just like a regular list on an iPhone. Well, that's the most complicated part of the entire application. After this, it's pretty basic coding. When the user taps on a channel, this view is presented and the onAppear function calls the loadData function in our view model. If there are no playlists yet, it calls the addPlaylist function. And that's found in the extension to our channel object. And it uses the same update manager function and API service that we used when fetching our channel. Only in this case, we're going to get more than one result back. But in all cases, the resulting data is mapped to a feed object that is then added to a core data entity. This model starts with the channel and the channel has a one-to-many relationship with playlists and the playlist has a one-to-many relationship with videos, making it easy to retrieve the corresponding playlist and videos for any given channel. Back in the playlist sidebar view model, if the list is not empty, it compares the last day that it retrieved playlists and the current day, and if they are not the same, it calls another function that will update the list with only playlists that are not currently saved yet. Once the data has been populated and updated, the playlists are displayed on the screen. When the user then taps on the playlist, this triggers a push of the navigation stack that will present the list of videos for that playlist. The functionality here is almost identical to fetching and displaying a set of playlists. The onAppear function loads the data, again checking to see if updates are required, and then presents a list of videos. The final piece is where the user taps on one of the videos, and this pushes the detail view onto the stack, which on an iPhone presents a new screen, but on the iPad and the Mac it replaces that third pane. The video detail view contains a vStack that uses a video web view that is a UIKit representation of a WK web view so that it can present the fetched video from YouTube. Now I have a video on blending SwiftUI and UIKit, and I'll leave a link for that in the notes below. It also presents a segmented picker control that will display the video notes or a text editor where you can record your own notes on the video. Now I encourage you to follow the code through so that you understand what's going on. And if you have any questions, please feel free to either DM me on Twitter or send me a direct email. You can find my contact information on my website, and the link is in the description below. I hope that you found this walkthrough useful, and that you'll be able to modify and enhance the code to meet your own needs. <laughs>